Good morning everyone and welcome to the second meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they can affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the meeting. The first item today is to seek the agreement of the committee to take item 3, consideration of its work programme in private. Are we agreed? Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda today is to hear evidence from the Minister for Housing and Welfare on a range of current and forthcoming housing issues. Can I welcome Margaret Burgess, the Minister for Housing and Welfare, and her officials, Bill Barron, Division Head, Housing Services and Regeneration, Caroline Dix, Acting Unit Head of Housing Supply Division, Barry Stocker, Team Leader, Private Rented Sector, and Stephen Garland, Head of Housing Sustainability Unit. Can I now invite the Minister for Housing and Welfare to make an opening statement? Okay, thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and talk a bit about the developments across the housing sector. At the outset, I would want to say that housing is and will remain a priority for this Government. Access to good quality housing is a vital part of the Government's drive to secure economic growth, promote social justice, strengthen communities and tackle inequality. And over the lifetime of this Parliament, planned investment in affordable housing will exceed £1.7 billion, and this investment will maintain momentum in the housing programme, deliver vital support for construction and house building companies throughout Scotland. And we are on track to meet both of our affordable housing targets. That's the five-year target to deliver 30,000 affordable homes by March 2016, and with 20,000 of those uh, affordable homes being for social rent. Three quarters of the way into the five-year target, we've delivered 22,762 affordable homes, 15,903 of these for social rent, which is almost 80% of our social rent target. The private rented sector is an integral part of the Scottish housing system, and we intend to improve security of tenure for tenants whilst providing appropriate safeguards for landlords, lenders and investors. So we're developing proposals for a new private tenancy system. Our consultation on a new tenancy system closed on the 28th of December. And so far, well, we have received 2,543 responses, which we're currently analysing and will ensure stakeholders are consulted throughout the policy development process. The Scottish Government's sustainable housing strategy sets out our vision for warm, high-quality, low-carbon homes that contribute to the establishment <coughs> of a successful low-carbon economy. Living in the right home with suitable physical features is clearly important, as are appropriate support services. The right support can be key to enabling older and disabled people to live safely and independently <coughs> at home. If suitable accommodation and support is not available when someone is ready to leave hospital, their discharge can be delayed, which is impacts on the patient's well-being and on hospital bed availability. Reducing the number of people waiting to be discharged from hospital is an absolute key priority for this government. We will invest, which was announced yesterday, a further £100 million over the next three years as part of our overarching commitment to integrating health and social care services across Scotland. And housing has a contribution to make, and we are working with the housing sector and proposals to deliver appropriate housing support and services. In November 2013, we held a major housing event attended by over 250 stakeholders. The vision for housing in Scotland remains the same, but we're looking at new ways to deliver. Working closely with the housing sector, we're working to deliver a five-year joint delivery plan for housing in Scotland, which we hope to publish in spring 2015. And I'm happy to provide the committee with more information on the plan as it develops. And finally, uh, convener, I wrote to the committee on the 18th of December in response to your follow-up review of the 212 homelessness commitment. And I'm pleased to say that the recently published statistics show a further decline of 3% in numbers of homeless applications. We're moving the right way in homelessness. The prevention approach is working, and it still remains a priority, though, to ensure that we continue in that line. Uh, thank you, Convener. Thank you, Minister. Uh, you mentioned that housing is a priority for the Scottish Government. Can you set out for us what the key housing priorities are for the forthcoming year? 
the, the key priorities are and has been to increase the supply of housing across all tenures in Scotland. Um, that is absolutely key to everything that we're trying to do. Um, we want to increase our housing supply. We also want to ensure that the quality of housing um, is high and improves, particularly in, in the private rented sector. We have taken steps to improve quality ready in the, the, the social sector with the, the Scottish housing quality standards and in the private sector. Um, we were regulating letting agents and giving local authorities um, powers, discretionary powers to tackle poor standards. Um, the, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the homelessness prevention, homelessness is also a key priority for the Scottish Government. We want to ensure that um, people have a right to settled accommodation, but also that we can work with local authorities and stakeholders uh, in the housing options approach to ensure that um, homelessness figures keep uh, falling uh, and, and go in that direction and continue to go in that direction. Um, so that, that is the, the absolute main priority. It's the, the housing supply across all sectors and also ensuring that people have access to good quality homes. You mentioned the um, five-year joint delivery plan, which has um, come out of the stakeholder event that was held last year and that will be published in spring of this year. Can you tell us what it will encompass and how does it fit into the existing strategy framework? The, the strategies, what I was saying that is that the strategies that we have remain the strategies, our vision for housing, that everyone in Scotland should live in a home, uh, a high quality home, um, suitable to their needs and as affordable remains a housing strategy. But what, with our housing strategy, strategies, we had to look at the, the framework in which we're now working with the financial economic framework and obviously the legislative framework and changes that are about to come and felt it was appropriate to look again at how we deliver those strategies. Um, so the strategies have not altered, um, but how we deliver them to best effect is what we were looking at in the delivery plan. The, the start of the process was about looking at our current strategies, looking at our current resources, and how we can best deliver and with a focus on increasing the supply. Um, but the, one of the, the, the priorities for, for this strategy is to have the buy-in from our stakeholders. It was a, a collaborative approach and a joint approach, uh, and we very much have to have the stakeholders on board to do that, which we have done. So, so far, there has been a draft plan um, prepared, which the Housing Policy Advisory Group um, looked at last week. Um, from that, they have identified, I think, around 30 actions across... Uh, supply, planning, um, quality, placemaking, all of the issues, the housing journey, and looking at the 30 um, actions. And now the group is looking at which organisation is best to lead on those actions and to deliver and, and focus on a timescale to deliver. So that's where it's currently at. It, it's at that stage. It's, it's quite embryonic at the moment because the, the committee, just the Housing Policy Advisory Group, just met last week to look at the, the sort of um, very first draft of the plan and, and to look at the actions and agree in the actions because what we're looking here for is consensus from the sector about the way forward. We believe very much there's a huge expertise out there in Scotland within the housing sector, and it's about how we can use that expertise and the resources that they can bring to the table as well to ensure that we can d get the plan uh, properly developed but also uh, deliver on it, which is important. Thank you. We will come on to some of the specific um, issues that you mentioned, Minister. Uh, you said that the overarching priority of the government was to increase the supply of housing. Uh, are you confident that the actions that the government are taking and that the resources that are being committed are sufficient to meet the estimates and the evidence of housing need which have been provided by a range of organisations in Scotland, including Shelter? I think what we're seeing very clearly is that um, £1.7 billion has um, been delivered been expended in delivering affordable housing throughout Scotland. We are also looking at other ways. Um, we have a target, as I said earlier, of 30,000 houses in the lifetime of this Parliament, 6,000 houses um, a year for affordable um, rent. However, 
in saying that, that's our baseline. And yes, we would want to, to exceed that target if we can. And that part of the, the joint delivery plan and looking at it is how we can attract other investment into housing, not just in the social sector, across all tenures, across the private sector um, as well. We need to get look at more innovative ways of funding for, for affordable housing. And that's what we're currently doing. There's a range of um, activity ongoing at the moment with our partners to try and get that investment, unlock other investment into housing to be able to deliver more houses than currently being delivered. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass to Alec, who has some questions. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. I was going to ask at the outset, the, the housing supply budget for 15-16, uh, to what extent is that allocated and is there still elements of that to be allocated to projects? Right. In terms of the budget for 15-16, the, the overall budget for 15-16 is in the range of £597 million. Um, in terms of the, the, the resource budget, all of that, I think I know officials can correct me if wrong, has been allocated. There's still some of the financial transaction money that hasn't been allocated yet and we will be announcing within the next um, few months how that money will be spent. I was going to ask specifically about the, uh, the f additional financial transactions. What are you going to use that £200 million for? We've currently, um, in terms of the total financial transaction budget for 2015-16, there's £340 million in total. Of that, we've allocated... Um, and previously announced £100 million for help to buy scheme, plus the £30 million for help to buy for the small builder scheme, which was announced last week or the week before by the First Minister. So that's £130 million has been allocated uh, for help to buy. £30 million has been allocated for the open market shared equity scheme. £25 million to charitable bond scheme and £3 million to the Rural Rent to Buy Scheme has been allocated. And I think the, the Finance Deputy First Minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, made very clear that the rest of the budget should be spent on affordable housing supply, and we're currently working up projects for that with our stakeholders. It hasn't been allocated to specific projects. You're quite clear on the policy areas where that money will be all yes, allocated. Yes, we're, we're looking at using that for the affordable housing supply and looking at ways of getting uh, <coughs> affordable housing at scale and ways of assisting uh, in pressured areas yeah. as well. You mentioned the, the Help to Buy scheme. Uh, and, of course, last year the Help to Buy scheme was launched and the allocated resource was all gone by July. Uh, and a lot of people were left disappointed, I think, when the money ran out. Uh, what level of demand are you anticipating for the Help to Buy scheme in 15-16? And do you think the demand will exceed resources once again? I think that there was a couple of things I have to say in terms of the Help to Buy scheme. The Help to Buy scheme is, is not doesn't sit in with our affordable housing um, budget. The Help to Buy scheme was, was set up primarily to um, increase the take-up of new build house to help the construction industry as well as get people uh, a new build house. We've, we've done a, a couple of things in terms of the scheme. We've reduced the maximum threshold price um, from £400,000 to £250,000, which should allow some more people access to that scheme. Um, we've also, as I said, um, allocated £30 million for small builders for a new small builder scheme to make sure that small builders are not losing out in that. The demand has been high for the scheme. However, the money has to be spent within the financial year and people can apply, I think, up to nine months in advance. So we are monitoring it closely. We, we receive monthly update reports. It's looked at closely by Homes for Scotland and by the Council of Mortgage Lenders, and we look at reports on that. So we, we, the people will still be able to and house builders will still be able to build houses up to the end of the, this financial year. Mm. The, just interested in something you said there, that money allocated under the scheme has to be spent in that financial year. Uh, is it therefore likely that uh, a proportion of the funds allocated may actually return uh, or, or not be uh, used? No, that's not anticipated. Um, absolutely. Caroline, would you perhaps <coughs> want to sure. add to that? 
as the Minister said, people can apply to the scheme and then it may take up to nine months for them to actually get the house that they want to buy to be built and to get their mortgage in place um, and to, to secure the house and then to, to draw down money to get the shared equity uh, from the government. So the planning for the scheme is very much about getting applications in and looking ahead towards the end of the financial year. And we monitor that closely on a monthly basis and at the moment it looks like there are enough applications coming in um, to take up all of the budget um, over the current financial year and next year. But we will wait and see uh, as the year progresses and uh, keep in touch with the agents that um, monitor the scheme for us uh, to make sure that we maximise the use of the resources that are available. Thank you. David. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Could you confirm that you, can meet, you will meet your 2016 targets for affordable housing? Yeah, we are on track to meet those targets. Um, at the moment, we are well on track meeting the targets. We've built 22,753, I think, houses. I said at the outset for our target, we're 80% there in our social housing target. And we're working very closely with all our partners and local authorities to meet that target. And the indication is that we will do so. Minister, could you also confirm your future uh, commitment to sustain and develop uh, social rents in Scotland? Yes, we are committed, and, and I've said that on more than one occasion, that social rent it remains a priority for the Scottish Government. And we have to look at other ways of, of other tenures as well, but social housing will always remain uh, a, pri a priority for this Government, and we would always intend to, to build social houses and, and work with our local authorities to do that and our RSLs. Thank you. The um, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, as you will know, I'm sure, have provided evidence to this committee of a shortage of affordable um, housing in Scotland. Do you agree with their analysis? I think, well, I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning, that we are all working to increase the supply of housing, affordable housing in Scotland, and that is a priority for this government. In saying that, <coughs> there is always going to be a limited resource in how we can build those or assist um, RSLs and councils to build those houses and others. We are looking at every way possible to get more finance, look at finance innovatively to ensure that we can maintain a supply of affordable housing. And I would say that you know th th this government is cu currently has built more social housing than any previous government. We are putting more money into housing and we continue to do that because it is a priority. So, in a sense, is there analysis that it's really a moving target? You've constantly got to be adaptable to try and reach that moving target. Always have to look at the demand for housing and what we can achieve. And our ambition is not to stop at 6,000 houses and once we've built those 6,000 in a year, say, well, that's fine, we've met the target for this year. Our ambition is to build as many houses as we can within the resources we have and look at getting other resources as well to continue to build to meet the demand. And you will know that um, RICS provided an excellent uh, report, uh, Building a Better Scotland. They made uh, a number of hard-hitting recommendations to increase investment in affordable housing. Do you agree with their recommendations, and are you going to be implementing that as a government? In terms of the, the RICS report, that, that report is one of a number of reports that has informed the way that we're going forward in terms of housing. And the, the event we held on the... 18th of November, considered that report, there were a number uh, of organisations there that, that looked at the, the report from RICS. They looked at that. We looked at the recommendation and uh, in, uh, in their suggestions in land supply and land reform, in, you know, as well as the land reform committee's uh, review, the land reform review, and that is currently being looked at and has been in part of the action plans that we're looking at, but will be consulting, as the government has already said, they'll be consulting in land reform. Um, but in terms of the RICS report, that has been looked at, and some of the actions in that will be uh, looked at in the, the, the joint delivery plan that we're taking forward. On so it's strategy. still very much part of your future plans? You've not ruled any of the recommendations in we or out we haven't, stage? We haven't uh, specifically said we're not doing this and we are doing that. It has been certainly been considered, along with a number of other reports, which have all been welcomed by us in terms of uh, adding to the, the debate and the way forward and increasing housing supply, because we're all looking for the same thing, and that's to increase the supply of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, David. Uh, James. Thank you, 
Ian, good morning, Minister. Uh, I wonder, following from your opening statement, if you could give us a bit more detail about what the Scottish Government hopes to achieve by reforming the private sector tenancy regime. I think it's part of, of what we're already doing in the, the private sector um, in terms of it's about boosting consumer confidence is one of the things in the private sector. The private sector, uh, rightly or wrongly, in, in, in wrongly in some ways and rightly in others, uh, had not a particularly good reputation uh, among consumers. And we recognise very much that the private sector is very necessary uh, as part of our housing system. And we want to ensure that there is confidence in that. And we also want to encourage uh, lenders and investment investors into the private sector. So that, that was behind it. We, we set up a review group to look at the tenancy regime within the private sector. And um, they made one recommendation, and that recommendation should be a single tenancy uh, for within the private sector and a new tenancy. And, and that's what we consulted on. So we're, it's about, but we also want to protect tenants, which is important, and also um, have appropriate safeguards for landlords and investors and lenders. We need all of them to, to, to buy in to what, how we move forward with the private sector to ensure that it is a thriving part of our housing system. I see that you had uh, over 2,500 responses to the consultation, you said. Can I ask you what were some of the main issues that arose from the consultation? The, the, concept, the responses are currently with um, a, a company, social media, not social media company, a company that, that's analysing social, analysing the, the, the a social research company. A social research company. I couldn't get the word. A social research company, which is analysing the responses for us. But anecdotally, in the comments I've had in, in speaking uh, to some of the stakeholders, were about uh, you know how will it work in practice, and that's always and that's what we have to be very mindful of. It's about will it work in practice? Will some of the the the, the kind of things that we consulted on in terms of tenancy, um, how will it work in practice? And we're going to have to work with our stakeholders to make sure that there isn't any unintended consequences of it. But, you know, we believe it can work and it can be a better uh, one single tenancy in the private sector uh, is the right way forward and one that, that people can well understand. But also we have to make sure it works. So that's that's the kind of main thing. It's more practical things. There hasn't been... Um, other than that, there hasn't been a lot of indication. Obviously, landlords have different views on tenants, and we have to get that balance right. Um, but other than that, it's, it's just waiting till we get the analysis of the results, and then we have to discuss this with stakeholders about how we take it to the next stage. Can I ask, I know that the, 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 the primary focus is about the, the tenancy for the private sector, but will there be protections and further protections in this for tenants from let's say, rogue landlords, if you like. Every constituency, MSP, every MSP, I'm sure, gets people coming to their, their surgeries complaining about the landlords. Now, let me get on the record. Most landlords are brand new, but there, there always are occasions where the, the tenant feels that they're, not, they're getting a raw deal, there's nobody to turn to, etc. Will there be any strengthening of protection for the tenant in, in regards to this through this? I think we've already done that in the Housing Act uh, 2014. There's quite a lot of measures in that Act that provides um, protection for tenants and a, a recourse with the, the, the Housing Tribunal, for example, if, if they're, they're, they're unhappy with the landlord there's, they're, and also the regulating of, of letting agents, enforcing landlord and registration kind of and, and a lot of local authorities are now stepping in that and taking action and this is not about removing landlords it's about getting landlords on board because we don't want empty houses we want houses that are well managed and would absolutely determine though in what we propose or what is there under the, the housing scotland act 2014 or 2013 i think 14 we're absolutely determined that you know that the regulation will have teeth and it will prevent some of the, the issues that you're raising and also in terms of the single tenancy we think that should be easier for both landlords and tenants to understand as well in terms of their rights when they're in the property. Okay thanks for that can I just ask the last question how will the legislative proposals be taken forward and when do you expect any legislation to be introduced to parliament? I think um, the, the proposal is and as we've said at the outset that we would um, it would 
we would have this legislation by the end of this, this Parliament. And I think the proposals were on time to bring a bill in the autumn to Parliament, uh, and by the, the end of this parliamentary term, we should have the legislation. It should be passed by then, hopefully. OK, thanks very much, Minister. Adam. Morning, Minister. Good morning. Uh, can I ask, how is the work of the Homes for Scotland private rented sector champion Jerry Moore linking into policy development in the sector? I think it's, it's very much the, the, the private rented sector champion came out of the, the, the building the private rented sector. Um, it was a recommendation from that report which, which we supported. And on the back of that, we have funded the private rented sector champion. We, we funded Homes for Scotland to appoint the private rented sector champion. And it does very much tie in with, with what I said um, at the outset about increasing supply across all tenures. And, and we do believe um, that we, sh we can increase the supply of the private rented sector uh, at a scale that we haven't currently seen. So the private rented sector champion will look at that, look at investment in the private rented sector, um, projects, pipeline, how we can do that and that, that's, that's his job, and I think it does tie in with what we're trying to do, and he's working with both Homes for Scotland and the Scottish Government to identify any barriers that there could be there for investing in the private sector. If there's barriers there, how can we overcome it? Can the Scottish Government assist in overcoming those barriers? So all of that work, it's still at early stages, but it very much ties in with what we're trying to do in terms of increasing the overall housing supply. Okay, so is there, in overcoming those barriers that you mentioned, is there uh, any prospect of the Scottish Government actually making some financial investment in the private re rented sector or encouraging that? At this stage, we, we haven't been asked to do that, but what we are saying is that, we, you know, if there's absolute strong evidence that the that is an absolute barrier, then we have to consider what's put in front of us. And, we, you know, we've not ruled anything out or in at this stage, but we would need to see the evidence that the sector can't, you know, be unlocked or the investment can't be there with, without government support. And, and, you know, as I said, it's the early stages, but at this stage, we, we haven't committed to, to funding at this stage, but we haven't committed to saying we're not going to either. <laughs> So some of the financial transactions, <coughs> transactions monies might be available for that kind well, of thing. I'm not going to at this stage say it is or it isn't because, as I did say very much uh, at the outset, that that money we're looking at that in the affordable housing supply very much how we can use it is that way. But there are other uh, ways the government can support uh, the private sector uh, and the building of houses in the private sector. And there's other ways that we can look at that as well. Okay, thank you, Minister. Thank you, um, Mike. Sorry, I thought you'd finished. Yeah. I thought you'd finished, sorry. No, I've got another question. Good. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> uh, um, can I ask, um, you, you'd mentioned uh, uh, letting agent registration and the new uh, private sector, um, uh, rented sector tribunal. Could I ask, can you update us on your plans for implementing the provisions in the 2014 Act on these matters? Well, we're currently just now, in terms of the, um, the letting agent regulation, um, we have committed to producing the, the code of practice. Um, I think we've, within 18 months of, of the legislation, we hope that that should be ready by 2016. We hope it comes in at the same time as the private sector tribunal, which we're, we're working on. Um, so we're working in both of those just now. We're, we're consultation. We're ready to, to looking at the draft code of guidance, uh, or code of practice, and the, the private said tribunal obviously has to come in with the Tribunal of Scotland Act. But we, we believe it's in course to come in at the beginning of 2016. Am I right in saying that? So yes. I'm just thinking here that I'm maybe getting. So we, are, we are in course for two, track for 2016. So we are we are on track with what we said we would do. Uh, at the time of the stage three debate. Okay, thanks very much. Pass it on now, John. Thank you, <laughs> Deputy Confeder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you have some questions. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Minister. And as you know, I'm passionate about 
uh, energy efficiency, and I wonder if you could uh, explain what the Scottish Government hoped to achieve from the implementation of the energy efficiency standards for social housing. Well, I think there's, there's two things that we're looking at. We would hope that it can help reduce people's fuel bills because, you know, you, I, 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 I'm very passionate about um, fuel bills and what people have to pay in their fuel bills. So, so that's that's one of the things we would hope it would, it would help reduce people's fuel bills, but also that it contributes towards our overall uh, carbon reduction. So that that's part um, and re greenhouse gas, you know, emissions. Um, and it fits very much in with our sustainable housing strategy, a vision that everybody can live in a warm, sustainable home that's affordable. So, so that's where we see the, the each standard uh, fitting in in that. Uh, thank you very much. And um, the, 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 uh, I understand that the government's in the process of developing draft regulations on energy efficiency for existing private sector homes. Um, I know some private sector landlords have made the point to me that um, often the, uh, the, these homes are in what they describe as the hard-to-treat uh, category, but um, there must be other issues uh, as well that you've come across during, uh, uh, that have arisen during the consultation. Um, could you perhaps talk us through some of these issues and also explain when you're likely to introduce the regulations to Parliament? Right. I think the, the, the first thing is that we haven't actually consulted yet on the, the energy efficiency standards in the, the private sector. You know, we realise that this is a, a it's quite a momentous thing to do this because unlike you know England, we are we're looking at standards across all of the private sector and not just the private rented sector. So we have been working in this. Um, so we've had a group looking at this since April 2013, and the group consists of you know, a wide variety of stakeholders, consumer groups, fuel poverty groups, climate change groups, local government, um, Scottish government, uh, and interested parties, looking at you know, how, what we're going to consult on and what, would, what is appropriate, how to take this uh, forward. So we've also commissioned external consultants to look at the overall you know, housing supply, uh, in the modelling of Scottish housing um, as well to look at that and we are going to consult I think in a few months time we will start the consultation. Now there's a number of things that we have to look at in terms of you know the consultation what we're looking at here um, so some of the kind of things we're looking at what's the lead in time um, before we have any regulation um, what standards should be set in terms of you know energy performance certificates should it be you know what, what rating is it going to be set at um, to start with? Um, when does it apply? Does it apply when a house is sold? Does it apply uh, when a house is let out to start with? Can that be transferred to, to a buyer um, from seller to buyer? We're looking at uh, those kind of things. Um, but then we have to look as well at, you know, is there a time scale when we're saying that every house in Scotland has to meet the standard? So, you know, these are big issues um, that we're taking forward. So we're, we're not um, giving any commitment to a date of regulation because we will have to consider very carefully um, the, the results of any consultation that takes place in that. We'll have to take account of that. Um, and not until then will we be introducing, you know, regulations to Parliament. But it is something that is ongoing. It's taken a, a lot of work, uh, and, and rightly so. But we have to get this one right because we're talking about every single house in Scotland. We also look, have to look at incentives um, from, if there's any incentives from the energy companies, how we can assist people to um, get their properties up to standard. We, we've done that with our HEAPS programmes, as you know, in terms of, uh, in, in, which applies also to some private houses uh, in terms of the, the area-based schemes. So, we are, and that's about using energy company money as well into it. So there's a lot of things that we've got to consider before we are absolutely ready to take this, you know, to, to take it to Parliament. But we are very committed to it. It's something we are committed to, to this. Um, we have to meet our carbon emissions targets. We're aware of that, but we also want to ensure that people's homes are as energy efficient as possible. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Minister. And I'm, 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 you take me 
neatly on to my next uh, question, uh, which concerns uh, um, climate change targets. Um, what, during the committee's uh, scrutiny of the draft budget uh, for 2015-16, the committee heard evidence that more action on home energy efficiency is required in order for the, the Scottish Government to meet the 2020 and the 2050 climate change targets. And, uh, um, and I just wonder, is your sustainable housing strategy robust enough to meet those climate change targets? And are you confident that you're providing sufficient funding to support the strategy? I think in terms of home energy efficiency, um, we're providing unprecedented amounts of funding in £94 million pounds this year and £94 million pounds next year. And we levered in from that, and, and local authorities and our partners levered in from that a further £170 million pounds of funding, which around £260 million pounds of funding uh, in home energy efficiency measures in Scotland uh, last year. And I think that, that's, that's significant. That's more than... than any other time. The overall trends in terms of emissions in households is reducing in the long term, but clearly um, when we're talking about houses and households, that there will be peak periods, so there will be times when it, you know, it's, it's very cold winters, we all turn our heating up, um, so there will be peaks, but I think we'll look at the long term trend, which is it, it reducing. So it is a challenge and, and we're not pretending it's not a challenge. We are uh, committed to spending money on this. Um, it's been difficult because of the changes that the UK government have made uh, with ECO um, which has constantly been changing and we've had to adapt our schemes to take account of that to make sure that our money is being used to best effect. Um, but currently we are, I think, attracting even in UK terms, and perhaps Stephen will come in here, we are attracting um, a good, a fair percentage, or, or you know, 11 percent, I think, of eco national measures, um, which which is, is is above our average 10 percent, I think, or, or 9 percent. So we are attracting um, eco funding in, but it is it is hard. It takes a lot of work, and it's working with our local authorities as well to ensure that we can do that. But we're not pretending that this, is, this isn't a challenge. It is a challenge, but um, we're putting unprecedented amounts of Scottish Government funding into it. I think we've got, had over 700,000 measures already installed in, in people's homes. A third of houses uh, are above EPC, sea level are, are above. Um, so, you know, we're going in the right track. Um, the long term is going the right way, but there's still a lot needs to be done. And perhaps, Stephen, is there anything you want to add to that in terms of... No, I, I, you, um, just in terms of the, the overall share that um, Scotland's achieved of the energy company obligation, it's, uh, it's, it was 11.7% uh, out of the overall GB market, which compares to about 9.3% of households. So you can see that the, the work we're putting in through the programmes is, is successful in terms of helping to lever in that additional support. If, if I could just tease out just a, a wee bit more information about that, because you mentioned the, the importance of having a long-term strategy, and I would absolutely agree with that, but it, it seems to me that um, uh, g given that, uh, and, and, and quite rightly, uh, the Scottish Government fuel poverty programmes are designed to interact with the UK ones and to complement them, and that seems sensible, but um, ECO appears to have been you know, uh, like one of those uh, magician's rabbits, now you see it, now you don't, now you see it again. Um, you, you know, uh, do, how productive are your discussions with the UK government on this idea that we need to take a long-term, consistent approach to energy efficiency, fuel poverty and climate ch uh, change issues? Well, I mean, I think we've been working... An official uh, official level, and both the energy minister and myself have made a number of representations to the UK government about how this is impacting and what we are trying to do here in Scotland. Um, and we've made it very clear. We've, we've argued very strongly for the the rural position in Scotland um, as well, and we continue to do that. But I think you know what we've we've got to do. While we're doing that in the background, we've got to practically 
work with what we have. Uh, and, and if that's the system that's there, we can argue you know, with the UK government that we, we don't think it's right or it's appropriate. But if that's what we've got to work with, what we're doing is looking at our resources, what we're putting in, and how we can use those to best effect to get the most out of it. And so far, you know, as I say, and as Stephen said as well, that we have been quite successful in terms of £260 million last year in you know, being spent in energy efficiency across Scotland. Yeah, and, and just one final question, if, with your indulgence, uh, convener. Um, uh, Nori Care of Energy Action Scotland has commented that some local authorities have not been successful in spending uh, some of the heaps of allocations that they've been given, and I think the Scottish government have been wisely allowed them to carry that carry that over into. Uh, you, you, the, the next year's budget, but um, to what extent are the Scottish Government's efforts to deal with fuel poverty impeded by the lack of readiness of councils in, in putting you know, schemes in place on the ground? I think, well, certainly my experience and in, in from visiting and talking to local authorities, they're very much, uh, they're working very hard <laughs> to, to use the money that they've been allocated um, I think last year there was some money that, that was not allocated, but some local authorities who were further ahead with their schemes then accessed that money. So all the money has been spent for the purpose it was allocated, and that's what we intend to see happening this year. That local authorities, some were further ahead than others, and that's always the case. But I think, and also there was delays at the start by the UK government and, and ECO, not sure how much we were going to get and how it was going to work. But certainly... Um, my uh, speaking to local authorities, visiting some of the, the projects, that some of the really good work that's going on there, there is a real commitment uh, to, to spend the money which is being spent and to improve housing in, in their area and to lower people's fuel bills. Everybody's focused on that. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Dave. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Minister, I'm sure you agree with me the importance of uh, keeping... Um, older people out of hospital and in their own, own homes. Obviously, one of the key aspects is adaptations. Um, what demands have you had from RSLs to increase budgets for adaptations to make sure that people are able to stay in their own homes as long as is possible? And secondly, what's your views on actually building a lot more barrier-free housing, which to some extent um, is crucial in keeping people in their homes without necessarily immediate adaptations? Yeah. Well, I think I absolutely agree that we're, we're all focused on people, keeping um, people in the, their own home and getting people into their own home as quickly as possible. And I kind of spoke a bit about that um, at, at the start. We, we certainly, the, in terms of the adaptations, you, you're asking about RSLs. I will pass this to officials in a moment. I haven't had any approaches made directly to me recently about increasing the RSL budget. We did increase it, I think, two years ago. Uh, we increased it to, to £10 million a year, and that's currently the, the budget for RSLs. Um, obviously, local authorities have a separate um, budget, as in terms of um, health boards look at the, the <coughs> privately owner-occupied properties. So the, the adaptations budget is, is not... I haven't had any... Um, to me, but it is important. It's absolutely critical. We are looking at. We had the adaptations working group who produced uh, a report, and we accepted their recommendations that adaptations should be looked at in, in ten, you know, tenure blind, uh, as opposed to in, in sort of silos, and how that that process could be made much smoother for people um, moving, uh, uh, getting the roti um, assessment and getting the adaptation. So that's been piloted currently in, in five areas, um, and that's been looked at just now. When that pilot's complete, we would then look at producing guidance to, to roll out over all local authority areas. And I'm sure you agree the importance of having joined up strategic governments so that we don't just ignore it in housing and find we've got huge problems in health. And I know from my own, own experience um, in social work, the vital importance of having it all joined up. If not, what we're going to have is bed blocking in a grand scale, and that already happens. We know what the demography of Scotland is. We know that people are living longer. We know the demands for those who've got a disability. So it's crucially important to get this right. What's your views about actually doing a survey of RSLs and asking them specifically about the issues they're facing as far as adaptations? Because we know the numbers are there. We know what the Scotland-wide stats are. Clearly, there must be pressure on RSLs 
if they're not telling you, perhaps a survey would help. I mean, certainly in terms of RSLs, we have had a number of discussions with RSLs in terms of the, the integration of health and social care, and RSLs um, made a number of representations to us in terms of housing and the contribution housing can make to integration of health and social care. Social care. And we took that on board in the guidance now housing has to be consulted. We've also um, support, funded the joint teams, and I think I'm right in saying in two two people from local authorities and two from RSLs to uh, work and make, raise the awareness of housing within the, the health and social care agenda. Because at the start, now I would agree at the start, I don't think housing uh, was considered as high as it, perhaps as high as it should have been in terms of that because it was very focused on health and social care. And I think there is an absolute recognition that the role housing has to play in this. And I think that's been very clear. Uh, and we're working in terms of the funding that was announced yesterday, how, you know, how that funding will be used and what proposals housing can work up. And we don't do it alone. It's not from housing. It's not from just the, the officials of the Scottish Government. It is with our stakeholders, which will include RSLs, and how we can actually assist that um, integration and also assist in the, the, the daily discharges. So um, you would consider surveying RSLs on this, or you would certainly consider representations uh, made by RSLs following our discussion today? We, we always uh, consider any representations made by RSLs uh, on whatever issue because we recognise the, the, the very important role they have in terms of the whole housing system. Um, so therefore we would always consider that. I haven't had any representations made to me. We will clearly be having discussions with RSLs in terms of the, the, the funding that was announced yesterday um, and we would want to hear their views on that. Finally, convener in this section, questions. Um, clearly, there, some, there are some uh, building standard uh, conditions as far as barrier-free housing is concerned. Would you have a look at that again to see if that can be extended and widened? Because in the long term, if you get that right, it will reduce your demand for adaptations in the long term. I mean, I, I'm certainly willing to look at anything. I know that in a, a lot, maybe it's someone else who knows more about building standards than me, but in a lot of the, 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 the properties that we're looking at now, they are built that they can be easily adapted uh, pro properties, for example, where a, a wall can come down to have a, a walk-in shower in a room to have a carer there. But certainly, we're willing. You know, if there's anything else that we can do that can improve that situation, then I'm sure we're, we're, we're more than happy to, to look at that. Right, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, just following on the theme about the integration of health and social care, the strategy for Housing Scotland's older people was launched in. Um, 2011, and you briefly touched on the pilots that are looking at single funding pots for adaptations, which were recommended by the working group. Can can you give us any more clarity around when that working group is liable to report, and when um, the strategy will be fully implemented across the country? Well, the strategy just now um, for age, home, and community um, was published jointly with COSLA in, in 2011, and that is monitored at the moment, I think I'm right in saying, and, and it has a, an outcomes framework with it. Um, and we're, we're looking at that and monitoring um, that, and we'll, we'll be a midpoint review in 2016. So they're currently, but perhaps... Um, it's me. It's myself. It's yourself. Oh, yeah. There's something missing here. Bill might want to say a bit more where we are in terms of that, the, the actual age home and community yeah, strategy. I I think it's it's worth noting that it's a ten year strategy and these are these are issues that need a bit of time to get right. So some of the things that are focusing on are um, provision of information um, to older people about housing advice and what, what their options are. And, and that's a huge agenda uh, which we have started on and there are councils which have expanded their housing options service um, to, to be providing advice to older folk. Um, that's got a bit further to go. The adaptations thing, um, there's the integration with social care and, and health. Uh, at the same time, there's the, the work that uh, the minister mentioned about uh, focusing on processes and see if we can streamline and, and make all that more efficient. Um, and I, I would also emphasize that the um, local housing strategy guidance, which we published last August, um, pushed this pretty hard uh, because quite a lot of these changes take time to 
to, to take through, particularly if you're talking about provision of um, more accommodation. Um, uh, so that guidance said pretty clearly to, to councils uh, that let's really have a push on thinking about this in the next round of local housing strategies. So there are a number of things going on which will um, take time uh, to come to full fruition, but which we're monitoring very closely. Because one of the issues that I'm contacted about probably more than anything in, in relation to elderly people in, in their homes is the time it takes to get adaptations mm. done. Um, and quite often someone will be assessed, they'll be told what they need in their, in their home. And if that's done and then their condition deteriorates, further adaptations are needed. Um, so I suppose it's about finding the balance of what adaptations do you do initially? But then it's also ensuring that any further adaptations are done quickly um, in order f for the, the elderly person to remain in their home. Is that something you're working with local authorities on? That's certainly one of the things that the five pilots are looking at yeah. explicitly. Hmm. I think that that's what the pilots are looking at, streamlining the process and getting that uh, done quicker and less waiting time. Cause, and it also does help with the delayed discharge thing as well if the adaptations are, are done fairly quickly. And, and, and is that the only piece of work you're doing with the housing sector or are, are there other pieces of work that you're doing with the housing sector around the integration of health and social care and how you manage that? Yeah, well, I think, go back to what, what I said earlier, and you may want to, to add to it, Bill, in terms of we, we've funded people um, we've, to, to work with the joint teams to look at how housing is very, it's still at very early stages. I mean, housing has now been included in the guidance and how housing can work in that. And RSLs, as was mentioned uh, by David Stewart, um, have been very active in this and promoting the role of housing. So there's a lot happening there just now, but it is at early stages and, and you know, we, we can certainly keep the committee informed in how we're progressing with it. And what about the private sector? Are you doing any work with the private sector? That's, is that the health board? Perhaps Certainly, the, uh, in terms of the delayed discharge issue, it mostly is private sector. The majority of older people um, are homeowners. Um, and there's, there's a huge amount of work uh, going on about how housing connects to that integration agenda. And quite rightly, you know, the integration agenda has had its own challenges about health and social care coming together. Housing's been mentioned all the way along in that, but we're now reaching the point where we need to put some specifics on those bones. Um, and it is things like adaptations, like advice, um, and like provision, uh, both you know, for people who... Uh, can return to their own home and also for those who maybe need to go somewhere temporarily before they return to their own home. Uh, and the housing sector's got a role to play in all of that. Um, and yes, all, all of that is being considered. Okay. Um, it would be helpful then if you could update the committee as, as that work progresses. That'd be very helpful. Um, can I move on now to talk about um, homelessness? Um, the committee undertook a follow-up review of the 2012 homelessness commitment um, and we wrote to the Minister with the findings and the Minister you have you have responded to us. Now you said at the outset that prevention of homelessness was one of your key priorities and while the, the statistics are moving in the right direction they are moving quite slowly in the right, in the right direction but there has been a decrease and I just wondered if you had um, any further comment to make f to the initial response that you gave us particularly in re relation to shelters concerns around um, homelessness. 34% of homeless people have support needs. Um, a large percentage of homeless applications are for from young people. A number of them will have come through the care system and may in some cases have multiple um, support needs. The five-year joint delivery plan does not mention homelessness uh, in any huge detail. Um, it's included in the plan, but the focus is on supply more than prevention and support work. And I just wondered um, if there was any further work you were going to do. The Homelessness um, Task Force had very clear priority and direction and did make quite a significant difference. And it seems that if there is that direction and focus on prevention of homelessness, looking at it in the round, not just in relation to housing supply, 
you can actually make more of a difference. I mean, temporary accommodation, the average is around 16, 18 weeks. But I know from work that, that I have done that there are many um, homeless people who are in temporary accommodation for more than a year. And that's not just about housing supply, it's about the needs that the homeless person has. And unless more focus is put on that, homelessness won't reduce. I mean, I think the facts are that, that since 2008-9, homelessness you know, has fallen by 36%. And I think that is something that, you know, the whole of the Parliament should welcome. Um, however, any homeless person is a concern for me. Uh, and, you know, so, so that, you know, I say that absolutely. And it is a priority for me, preventing homelessness uh, and reducing homelessness. Um, but I would say, in, in response to, to, to some of the... the, the the, the, the things that you mentioned there, that we do have a duty um, in local authorities to provide support to homeless people who require it, and that is a, a statutory obligation in local authorities. And part of the housing options approach is to identify, work with the individual, identify what support they require, and ensure that that support is provided, whether it be by the local authority themselves, whether it be by a, a dependency agency, or a variety of agencies. And that's very much the whole homelessness approach that we're taking just now focuses on the individual and the needs of the individual. It is very person-centred approach, and that's what we're looking at. Now, I will absolutely accept there will be situations that, that you mentioned that somebody, um, it's not, the support is not as quick or as, as, um, as you, you talked about. But in general, uh, that support is there, it is being provided, and that's why homelessness figures are, are falling, and the repeat homelessnesses are falling because that support is being provided from the outset. Um, in terms of the time spent in temporary accommodation, I think what, what I would want to say is that the majority of the temporary accommodation is of a good standard. It's local authority accommodation, um, and, it is a, and it's well managed. and. Uh, the majority of it, and I think I have to say that. But we still do have the Homeless Strategy and Prevention Group, and that group still sits. And that group came out of the Homelessness um, Task Force and Commitment Group, and that group still meets. It meets regularly. I attend as well because, I, I, you know, I, I say again, homelessness is a priority for me. The group has a standing item on the agenda that looks at homelessness um, in, among young people. Uh, young people in homelessness, and that is always a standing item in the agenda. The, uh, the group is also looking at um, basic standards of temporary accommodation and actual the costing of temporary accommodation, and that includes things like you know replacing white goods, furniture, beds, that kind of thing. So that is being looked at. There's very, very strong awareness out there of the support that's required for homeless people uh, in preventing repeat homelessness in particular, and that has worked. Um, and we're, we're, we're still striving to that and working to that. It, it's a priority. Can I just ask you then, does, does that working group, does that feed into um, the five-year joint delivery plan and any changes that you would make to the delivery plan? Well, all of the, the members of the group, and I'll pass on to Bill as well, but all of the, the members of the group are involved in organisations that are part of the, the delivery plan and looking at you know which actions we will take forward. But certainly, you know, represented in that, that, that group. It's not just a group within the Scottish Government, it's a group of stakeholders. But Bill, do you want to maybe add to that? I think just to say that the, the things that focus in the Joint Delivery Plan are perhaps those that needed most refreshment of the approach. So some of the, the stuff around supply and, uh, and so on, where difficulties of the economic situation and so on. Um, and the, perhaps the reason that there's not much about homelessness in there is that the homelessness agenda is going from strength to strength. And there's already a great deal of attention on it, as, it, on it, as the minister says. I'm, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with, with, with what you say, but, but homelessness is coming down. But it's not. Certainly, in my view, and certainly in the constituents that, that approach me, it's not coming down quickly enough. And I think to lose the focus from that five-year joint delivery plan. Um, in, in my view and, and in the view of others, will certainly it's almost as if you're taking your eye off the ball um, and, and it will slip down the priority. And that, that's the concern. 
I, I'm more than happy to go back and look at that delivery plan because, and I said, you know, in my opening remarks, that homelessness is one of the priorities in preventing homelessness of this government. And if there's a perception that in any way that the delivery plan is not treating that as high a priority or as the priority is, then I'm more than willing to take that back to the group um, through the officials to look at that to ensure that, that it's clear that homelessness and preventing homelessness is and remains a priority for the government. That would be very, um, very helpful, Minister. Yeah. I would appreciate it if you would do that. Um, what progress has been made to develop and implement the new housing options guidance? The guidance um, was introduced, the housing options guidance, I think at the last consulting on it. meeting. Redraft. Yeah, and, and the, there was a first draft um, produced at the guidance um, and I think the, the, the regulator made a number of recommendations and I think we're currently at the stage where um, the group is going to meet with the regulator to discuss if the, the issues that the regulator raised have been properly addressed in the guidance before it's then put out for further um, or it's produced, you know, the final draft is there. It is a guidance, but certainly, clearly, it has been, um, the draft has been put together, it has been discussed, it has been consulted on, the group have looked at it, and it's now going to be discussed with the regulator to ensure that the, the recommendations the regulator made have been addressed, or if there still remains any uh, disagreement in that. And will there be plans to review that guidance on an ongoing basis? I think with any guidance, I don't know if there's plans set in it, and, and perhaps somebody can help me here if it says this will be reviewed on a whatever yearly basis, but I think with any guidance, there is no guidance that is guidance for life. Any guidance has to start to take account of any changes and changes in legislation, change in policy. So I, I think for anyone to say a guidance is there forever, um, it just isn't the case. It will be looked at, and the group will continually... Uh, be looking at that and, and, and I'll feed that back as well. That we would anticipate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Convener. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I'd like to return to the issue of supply of housing because that's the issue which you and the Scottish Government have identified as being your overarching priority in terms of housing policy. Uh, and you said that um, increasing the supply of affordable housing um, is absolutely the priority of the Government in order to meet unmet housing need. Now, 180,000 households reg are registered on local authority housing lists in Scotland. 28,500 households were assessed as homeless in Scotland in 2013-14, and over 10,000 uh, families are placed in temporary accommodation. Now, can I ask you again, are you confident that the levels of investment being committed by the Scottish Government are sufficient to meet these estimates of housing need? I think what I'm saying is that, uh, and did say earlier, that we are committing considerable amounts of money, unprecedented amounts of money, into affordable housing, and, and we're continuing to do that. We're also looking at how we can get other, um, attract other investment into housing to increase the overall supply. We haven't got, uh, you know, I would like to think yes, we, we, you know, we had, we had copious amounts of money that we could fall back on uh, any time that we, we wanted. We don't have that. We are working within the, the budget that we have for housing just now. We are working uh, very hard to make that budget grow in other ways, to you look at innovative ways of building houses, as we did with the National Housing Trust. For let it, very little Scottish Government um, money, we have got around 2,000 houses on board for about a two-point six million guarantee uh, so it's about innovative looking at that how we can um, stretch the money we have how we can attract more funding into housing to to increase the housing overall housing budget to increase supply of housing uh, and that's what we're, that's what we're currently doing the government would argue that it's doing more than ever before and more than any previous government but is it sufficient to meet these estimates of housing need well, clearly there, there is a housing need there, and we're not arguing with that, that there are people waiting for houses. What we're saying is that given the resources that we have, uh, given the, the, the cuts that we have had from Westminster to our budget, um, we're using the budget we have added to the budget as well. We have increased the budget 
um, from last year with the financial transactions, which is a 62% increase from 2014-15. We have £340 million of financial transactional money into housing. At every opportunity um, the Finance Secretary has had, we have increased the housing budget. Uh, and we continue to do so, and we're building more houses with less money than any previous administration. The Scottish Government's projections, and this is from a um, briefing from Shelter Scotland, uh, show that each new investment of £100 million in the housing sector supports around 1,000 jobs directly, with an additional 600 jobs within related supplier industries. So clearly there are, there are sound reasons why we should be investing in housing, meeting unmet housing need, helping to grow the economy, meeting our climate change targets, tackling in uh, fuel poverty. Um, I mean, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but you know, given all of these um, compelling reasons for investment in housing, shouldn't we be doing more? I think what we're saying is we're absolutely agreeing, and that's why we're spending the money we're spending in houses in terms of the construction sector, in terms of the jobs that we're supporting with, with the money we're putting in. We've also, in terms of the help to buy funding, um, assisting the construction sector in jobs and providing houses, and that's out with the affordable housing um, supply as well. So we're doing what we can uh, with the funding that, that is available to us um, to, to build as many houses as possible, and that still remains our target. Uh, and we're doing that in very, very difficult financial circumstances. And bearing in mind that um, Westminster have recently um, signed up to further austerity, which will impact on the Scottish uh, budget as well. So we've got to you know, have that in mind as, as well, that how that will impact all of the services that are provided here by the Scottish Government. Can I ask you about housing completions, uh, Minister? Um, completions across all sectors fell below 20,000 in 2009-10, and this figure is now below 15,000, and that's according to the housing statistics for Scotland. Uh, can I ask you if you feel we've got the financial uh, and policy framework uh, that's necessary to maximise the the level of housing completions? I think um, in terms of completions, I'm, I'm not quite sure, convener. Uh, you're talking about all sectors in terms of the, the private sector as well. Um, yes. I, um, I, I'm just not clear uh, where you're coming, but what? Across, it's across I, all. I, I will reiterate what, what I said sectors. earlier, and then I'll perhaps, perhaps ask Caroline to, to comment on the completions. I'll reiterate what I said <coughs> earlier that we are building more houses, completing more houses than any previous administration in the Scottish Government, and a reduced budget. Um, it is a, it's been a challenge. It's been very challenging. We have had to, to adapt to, 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 to rise to that. We have done it with our stakeholders, and they're working with us as well to, to increase the supply of houses and to ensure... Given that the, the, the level of housing completions has fallen, have we got the policy and I'm funding not, framework I'm, in place to, to maximise those? I mean, I accept that we just... Well, you, what, you what I'm saying is that, that, that we will meet the target that we set out to meet, which is 30,000 affordable houses by the lifetime of this Parliament. Perhaps, Caroline, you want to talk about the completions and you've got the chart there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, as, as the Minister said, the, the rate of completions for affordable homes... Um, where the government is providing grants or loans uh, to provide these homes um, to councils and housing associations is holding up really well, and the statistics um, are good uh, over the last few years. In the private sector, um, it's been struggling more to catch up in terms of the, the pre-recession levels of building. Latest statistics have shown now things starting to turn, so uh, things are looking more promising. But I don't think um, in terms... Of I haven't got that to hand, but we can certainly provide that. It's, the situation is looking more promising, so what's that based on? It was, it was based on the latest um, quarterly statistics that were published yeah. for um, building completions in the private sector. There was a slight increase in terms right. of the previous trend, so okay. there was some movement, some positive movement, but nowhere near the, the rates that were being built uh, before the recession um, in 2007-2008. And because of that, the government is continuing to work with uh, stakeholders, particularly organisations like Homes for Scotland, to look at what action um, the government can take to help support that sector 
to help increase um, completions. And one of the major ways that we have been doing that, as the Minister mentioned earlier, was through the loan funding that's been provided for the Help to Buy scheme. Um, but there are another, a number of other actions uh, that we're looking at in terms of increasing supply. Um, the other one that was being discussed this morning is the funding for um, Jerry Moe to look at increasing the supply of new homes in the private rented sector. So there are a number of actions being looked at to try and help uh, across a range of sectors to make sure the completions are maximised. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you now about the Smith Commission um, and the difference that that might make? The Commission report proposed a range of welfare powers to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. A particular relevance to housing is the proposal to allow the Scottish Government to vary the housing element of universal credit. The Scottish Government has previously expressed a view that the bedroom tax should be abolished. Mm. Have you a view on how the devolution of further welfare powers proposed by the Smith Commission, albeit that that still has to be enacted through legislation at Westminster, can most effectively be used to support Scotland's housing policy in meeting our, our housing targets? I think in terms of um, the Smith Commission, we do think that further powers relating to welfare, energy efficiency and fuel poverty can support the Scottish Government's vision for a housing system where everybody can access a good quality, affordable home. But in terms of um, the detail of that, it's actually too early to discuss uh, how we can use those new powers because it's not actually clear yet what the powers are, to what extent we are actually going to, to have them. I think the date is... Thursday, we should get some of the clauses of how some of these powers um, may um, come to Scotland, particularly in relation to welfare. Um, but we have said right from the outset that we are committed to consulting widely with all stakeholders and the wider um, community before we make any decision on how the powers should be used. We really think we have to take on board the views of others. We've said clearly in, in things like the bedroom tax, what our view is, and that review remains, but we're not actually going to get that power anyway to abolish it. But uh, in terms of other powers, we need to wait and see what we get, and then we need to consult to see how we can use them. But we do think uh, the powers as proposed uh, could uh, help uh, us achieve our vision for housing, but as always, the devil's in the detail. The, the Scotland Act 2012, um, prior to uh, this debate we're now having about Smith, um, allows the Scottish Government to borrow uh, to a greater extent than at present, up to I think around £300 million. Pounds. Will, your be, will your department be making a bid for some of that, that funding? Except that, that that's not a target, it's a limit. Uh, up to which the, the government can borrow? I think at this stage we'll, we'll wait till the, the finance secretary um, indicates and, and there is agreement that we are going to, to use the borrowing powers because obviously with borrowing you, you pay back, we have to look at what we get in the overall picture. Um, and at that point, you know, we decide whether or not it's something that there will be clearly... Um, across government, everyone will be looking for more. And I mean, like anyone else, of course, we, we would like to... Um, say that we would want some of that money for housing, but at this stage I, I'm not going to sit here and say yes, I'm going to go out there and ask for that uh, money for housing, but I can assure you um, housing um, has a loud voice um, and with our new cabinet secretary as well within the Scottish Government <coughs> and any opportunity there is to increase the funding for housing will be certainly there. Okay. Thank you very much Minister. David. I'd like to talk about the Scottish Housing Regulator. You will know that we have taken some evidence on this subject. Some of the RSLs have suggested that the regulator could be more proportionate and transparent and less of a micromanager. What's your assessment of that evidence? Well, I think what, what I would have to say in terms of the regulator, that Parliament made the regulator independent of government and there is, there is no way that I'm going to either control or direct the regulator how to operate. So, you know, I have to be careful what I'm saying in this. I have followed the, the, what the committee, uh, the evidence sessions the committee has taken from the regulator. I have met with the regulator uh, as I meet on a regular basis just to, to hear the work that they're, they're carrying out and what's happening. As I regularly meet with the, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Glasgow, Glasgow and West of Scotland Federation of Housing Associations, I am aware that they, they raise those concerns, but I also understand that they are in discussion 
with the regulator about how they can they can address it so that they can be a I think we all agree a regulator is necessary and that the regulator should be independent and there will often be disagreements between a regulator and who they're regulating. But I do think that they are beginning to talk together now to look at how they can address this and have a better understanding of what to expect when the regulator um, becomes involved. But the regulator has just one main aim, and that's to safeguard the interests of tenants. But who guards the guards? The Parliament guards the guards. Uh, in terms of the regulator, the regulator is certainly independent of government uh, and is accountable to, to Parliament. And when you're introducing an appeals mechanism against decisions of the regulator? I am not uh, of the view that that's something that the government can do, is introduce uh, an appeals uh, regulation. There is a regulatory bill going through, is it gone through at the moment for, for all regulatory authorities, uh, of which I understand the regulator is part of, um, and the regulator themselves will have to set out how they are going to deal with appeals and complaints. Now, if, I, if I'm perhaps wrong in this, someone can, can tell me so. And presumably when they do that, they will do that in consultation with their stakeholders, who are both presumably tenants and the, the landlords that they, 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 they regulate. And this committee will be able to get that information from, direct from the regulator. So the Scottish Regulators Code of Practice is in draft form. I mean, government presumably has a role in this. Are you saying there's no role for government in the, the draft Code of Practice? I, I, Bill, perhaps you want to come in here. You deal with the regulator. My, my understanding is the regulator will consider if something the, the, the government says, but at the end of the day, if you have an independent regulator and then the government is seen to put influence on that regulator or direct that regulator, then that independence uh, is compromised. Obviously, if it's for Parliament to make decisions on this, and by and large it's government that takes forward legislation, um, how, how else are we going to have new changes on regulation? We haven't had any proposed to government at this stage, by Parliament or by any committee, have we? Can, no, can you, uh, it's the draft code of this? practice. Once the code it's of the practice is um, mm -hmm. approved by Parliament and comes into force, then... As I understand it, it says um, that the bodies subject to it have to have uh, in place their own independent and impartial appeal mechanisms um, so that it, that code then puts the onus on the regulator to uh, work out its own system. Mm. But presumably that's part of government's programme for government, that if, if legislation's coming forward. Who else would you suggest would bring the legislation forward? The committee or members' bill? Huh. Yeah. What, what legislation are we talking well, about? Well, you're talking about the draft code of practice. Is that not going to have statutory hold on regulators? Um, I assume it will. It's, it's going through Parliament just now, isn't it? Mm. But that, that code of practice is for all regulatory bodies. Yes. Um, and within that code of practice, once that's been approved by Parliament, then each regulatory body has to set... Yes the appeals process and a complaints process and how they will handle it. Mm. Yes, I mean, I, I do understand that, Minister. I'm really making the point, what is government's position on this? That's what I'm trying to f flesh out from you. On the code of... Yeah. The Should general code of practice? I'll come, I'll come back now. It's not, it's not yeah. an issue for, for me specifically, but I'll yeah. certainly Thank um, you. come back to the I committee would appreciate on that, that uh, Thank you. specific Thank you for point. your answers. Yep. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions that members have on the regulator or any other matters that we've discussed this morning? Are there any further points you would like to make, Minister? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think I've covered everything. In that case, it only remains for me to thank our witnesses this morning for their, their patience and for their comprehensive and thorough evidence. And that concludes the committee's business in public today. And we will now move to private session as previously agreed.